thanks a lot, and in particular, thanks to the organizers for, the great, for my great pleasure to be here. So, um, I would like to, uh, to talk about uh, metamorphosis, and today, uh, of, in a generalized context, mainly uh, for patch-based images and for uh, uh, images described by, uh, uh, by uh, feature mappings. And uh, this is joint work with uh, Alexander Effland, uh, my former PhD student, Ulrich Kopler, Thomas Pock, all the three are now at Graz. And uh, um, so this is on metamorphosis, uh, and this is basically the literature basis of this, uh, uh, starting off uh, from the flow of diffeomorphism context with the very early work in this direction. And I just cited here two of the main references, and uh, then uh, the metamorphosis story uh, started early uh, uh, this century, and uh, uh, in particular this uh, uh, theory paper in, uh, in the Siam uh, uh, Mathematical Analysis Journal uh, by Alain Trouvé and uh, Laurent Younes uh, is uh, important, to, has been important to establish this theory. And uh, we tried to come up uh, with uh, a time dis variation of time discretization, which I'm also going to use today. And uh, if it comes to um, manifolds of images, where the image is a map into uh, uh, a pointwise map into manifolds, so there is a, a very nice paper by uh, Gabi and her co workers uh, in this direction. So uh, let me start uh, with. Uh, uh, what is Riemannian calculus? Uh, so we think of a Riemannian manifold with a metric G, and uh, we can uh, define on paths U. So the U in this context is now uh, some path in M, and we think of boundary conditions. So we want to connect with an interpolating path UA and UB. And uh, so here is some UT. Um, and here is the uh, tangent uh, u dot t, and u a will be u of zero, u b will be u of one, and uh, then we uh, have to uh, minimize uh, the uh, integrated uh, metric along uh, along this path. This is uh, what we do to compute geodesics. So geodesics are local minimizers. And uh, now we don't speak about any manifold. We speak about the manifold of images. So what is the U? So the U is uh, a map on some image domain into Rm. And uh, M typically is 1 for grayscale images and 3 for RGB images. And uh, now this metric uh, uh, picks up these concepts here. And uh, if we design the metric, we would like to, uh, to penalize the cost of changing the image. And there are two effects which lead to a change of image. One is transport. Uh, and uh, the cost of this is the viscous dissipation spanned into the fluid, and the other cost is uh, changing along with the transport uh, uh, the uh, intensity value. So we suppose that there is uh, some flow field and uh, sorry, some uh, flow field V uh, which does some transport. So particles are flowing with this uh, velocity. And if you now look for the image intensity along, along such transport paths and differentiate this with respect to time, then we see the material derivative by the chain rule. And this is what we will call Z. And uh, there is now dissipation due to the flow, and there is cost due to the uh, uh, due to a non-vanishing uh, um, material derivative. That means an effective uh, modulation of the image intensity along transport paths. So that means in this context of metamorphosis, uh, we study now uh, the following uh, 
the following metric. So there might be various motion fields underlying the image, and the motion field surely influences uh, this material derivative. So there might be perfectly fitting motion fields and less fitting motion fields. So to calculate the metric, we minimize overall motion fields, and then uh, we integrate in, uh, in, on the image domain, which is supposed to be in uh, a subset of Rd, and D in our case is mostly 2 here. And uh, there is uh, some measure of the dissipation which comes with the flow, and there is a cost penalty term for the, uh, for the uh, material derivative. And uh, this here, how to choose this cost if we start with the classical viscous Newtonian flow, a good measure for this is uh, to take the viscosity of, uh, of Newtonian flow. And um, and add a higher order term to ensure that what we have there are really diffeomorphisms. So this is done by adding here gamma and the m derivative of uh, v squared, and m maybe is, is supposed to be larger than one plus uh, d over two. So that means our flow is. Uh, uh, generates a family of diffeomorphisms. And uh, so this is uh, uh, basically uh, uh, the overall ansatz of our metric. And to make it precise, we have to define Z in weak terms. And that means we just test with a test function, integrate in time and space. And use integration by parts to come up uh, with this definition, what is a weak material derivative um, for all eta in uh, C infinity with compact support uh, on this uh, space-time domain. And uh, so this is uh, the overall setup. And we studied this uh, for gray scale images and color valued images. Uh, uh, but images are effectively more. And uh, there are two more general perspectives onto images, uh, which I'm going to consider today. And this is we can consider images as composition of patches. Uh, so patches describing textures, as we have seen it, uh, uh, for instance, in uh, Christian's talk today. Uh, or we can locally characterize images by, by feature vectors. And the first approach is more a synthesis approach. So really, we describe how we build up images, and then we feed these images precisely into this uh, setup. And the second is more an analysis approach, where we do not treat uh, image intensities or color-valued image intensities here, but we treat this approach uh, for uh, the feature, the local feature description of an image. And I would like to start uh, with the first approach, basically using these VGG uh, features introduced in this, uh, uh, in this paper by uh, Simoni Simonian and uh, Sisseman, uh, where they uh, come up with a local feature description of images, which are basically rotation invariant and uh, uh, describe in high dimensions the local content uh, of, uh, of the image. So I'm first addressing now uh, the analysis approach. And in this case, so I try to come up with a continuous version of, these, uh, of this uh, uh, setup. So we have a map F, which maps uh, an image, uh, which is supposed to be in uh, L infinity from the domain 
into Rm onto uh, a feature vector pointwise in high dimension. And uh, so this, this is a multi-scale approach, which I will not uh, uh, go into too much detail today. Uh, and this uh, C varies on core scales starting from 8 and on fine scales uh, uh, something like uh, 64. And it encodes the local structure of, um, of uh, the image. And mathematically, what's nice, because behind this mapping is a, a, a convolutional neural network uh, with 19 layers. Uh, so surely the idea, if you think of analysis, uh, can be that this is a compact mapping. And um, so what is, uh, what is now the problem? So we have these images UA and UB. And now we use this uh, feature map to map them onto FA and uh, FB. And then we use, uh, uh, use the algorithm. And uh, the algorithm uh, means uh, we minimize the path energy defined here, but now we don't plug in here into the path energy or image intensity, but just the feature map. So the F subject to the boundary constraints and then uh, we uh, relax the path and consider this as a geodesic path in this uh, feature map uh, image space. We did this, but unfortunately, uh, uh, with uh, uh, non-perfect results. And basically, uh, uh, there was one improvement uh, required uh, to make this, uh, make this working. And this improvement was that in the image, if we perfectly describe it by these features, um, it, really make, it really is important to differentiate between objects. In the image, there might be moving objects in front of background. So that means the, the good identification of object boundaries is even more important than in the classical method. How to enforce this? Yeah, enforcing is quite easy. So we can uh, define an anisotropy, which uh, identifies edges in the image. So it means we take a Gaussian, convolute the image, uh, and differentiate this, and then to get close to the structure tensor, another Gaussian outside, and we plug this into the, with a minus sign up front, into the uh, exponential, and uh, we divide it here uh, inside the exponential by some, some alpha, and this is our anisotropic weight for the identification of features, and then we just plug it in here, over here. And uh, that means we plug it in over there and over there. And uh, so we would like to do the same over here. How to do this if we just do, do the, the morphing of uh, feature maps. So it's no big deal to assume that the original image intensity is part of this feature vector. We suppose that it is uh, stored into the two in the to the first m components of our feature vector, and that allows us uh, to uh, to compute uh, the uh, the anisotropy. And uh, once we have done this, the question is how to uh, how to discretize this and uh, how to come up with a uh, effective discretization of, uh, of this, uh, uh, this problem. And there we pick up our approach for the variational time discretization. And I think what I should do now is making this descent and making this race. And uh, let us discuss uh, the uh, time discussion. So, 
So in the time discrete case, we suppose that we have a, uh, just a set of, uh, of images of feature valued images And uh, so here might be some f k minus 1, and here is some f k. And then we can set up an approximation of uh, the uh, path energy by a discrete path energy, where we have uh, k plus 1 um, shapes. And we define it as a sum of energies acting on consecutive pairs of uh, these, uh, uh, these image maps. And there must be, because of Cauchy Schwartz, uh, a k up front here. And we start with 1 and we end with k. And the idea is uh, that we take here an approximation of the uh, squared Riemannian distance on this, uh, on this manifold. And uh, what does this actually mean? It actually means that we think of, uh, of the whole thing as the energy stored in a chain of springs, springs in between consecutive objects. If you think, for instance, of, a, of an embedded uh, 2D manifold in R3, you place a chain of strings on this manifold, and then you let, that let relax this chain under the condition that all your points stay on the manifold, then you get a good approximation of uh, a geodesic path. And that's the uh, core idea here. And this all can be made rigorous in terms of, uh, of gamma convergence chain of springs and their energy. And uh, actually, in our context, uh, we choose uh, the following uh, W functional. And like up there, where we introduce a new variable V and minimize in the definition of metric, now we basically cook up here a matching problem for images F and F tilde, feature space images. And uh, so now we minimize over deformations phi. And uh, what we minimize is the following. So first, something which approximate this uh, dissipation measure is in of the flow. Uh, this is uh, some W function, depending on our anisotropy and on the gradient of uh, the deformation plus uh, um, plus uh, this term here, dm phi square, plus 1 over delta f tilde minus f square. And uh, this term here, if you now Induce more and more steps, we see what we effectively see from this is the Hessian. And if one half of the Hessian of this energy with respect to the deformation and not with respect to the images stored over here it equals the L which we have over there, maybe I don't make this too precise with this relation between phi and, and uh, v. Uh, so basically, uh, um, discrete uh, time quotients of, uh, difference quotients of this phi are discrete velocities, and that is the link here. And here you see, this here is effectively a discrete version. So we evaluate stepwise, steps are given by this deformation along 
uh, along small deformations, uh, uh, the intensity here or the feature, um, and that means uh, this is a discrete uh, material derivative along the flow, which stepwise step defined by all these phi's here. So this is a discrete counterpart of this. There is just k square missing, uh, which by scaling appears naturally again. So this is uh, uh, the setup, and what we actually have to minimize then is an energy which depends on all these feature maps and on the corresponding deformations. And if we look for F, then we see F here enters quadratic. So that means the Euler Lagrange equation with respect to this is a linear problem. It's a large block structured uh, linear system which is very easy to solve. And the phi problem is a local problem because uh, uh, for fixed F, uh, it completely, de dis uh, completely um, uh, can be isolated uh, on consecutive pairs. We can separately minimize for the phi here, the phi there, independent of the other phi's for fixed, uh, for fixed F. So that's uh, not too costly problem. And uh, in this feature-based setup, it's basically a combination of this linear solver, linear solver, and, uh, and uh, IPOP. And I would like to show you uh, some results of this. So here is, uh, at first, uh, in RGB space, not in feature space, a um, geodesic curve of what we have been fairly proud of a couple of years ago. Uh, but there are some significant drawbacks. So you see here blending uh, of the RGB image of one uh, um, portrait of Van Gogh into another portrait years later. And uh, if you concentrate here on the ear, then you see even though one might expect that this ear is blended into this, the blending basically happens by blending of colors. If you go for the feature space, there is a very natural blending of the ears. And also the rest, the hair is naturally blended. I will finally show you some, some videos uh, demonstrating this much, much better. So here is the direct comparison, even more enlarged here. So here you see an intermediate blending of colors, no blending along transport paths. And here, it's a nice blending of uh, features and correspondingly of, uh, of the associated color values uh, uh, via this, uh, oops, on, on the black backboard, red doesn't work, uh, based on this, uh, on this uh, included uh, color vectors. And uh, what you also see here, here is now the anisotropy. And uh, here is uh, color-coded uh, the velocity. And you see there is a substantial change of velocity in time. It's not uh, optimal transport. It's, uh, it's really viscous flow, what we see here. Uh, so this is another blend between uh, two uh, presidents. Uh, uh, And again, here you see now the, uh, in this case, uh, not that highly varying uh, flow field. And here you see a blend between this cat pose and this, uh, this tiger pose. And again, you, in RGB space, you see there, is, there are only minor modifications. And uh, this is now the flow field in the feature space case. And uh, if we highlight two intermediate images, then you see a serious problem with the RGB space. So you see here that this, this part of the height is actually artificially blended in. And uh, if you start counting teeth, you see that there are simultaneously the cat and the tiger teeth. Yeah? And here, everything is fine. So there is a perfect blending of the height up there. And uh, there is a perfect rearrange, almost perfect rearrangement of the uh, of the teeth. 
Uh, no, 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 no. This is just the, uh, this is just this here. Yeah? The, the color vector is just pi to the feature vector. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, this is just solving this large linear system to do the image interpolation once the flow field is given. Okay, let's uh, get to the, um, uh, the other approach, which I like more, but the results are not that perfect. I already announced this. You will see what is the problem about this. So this is now the synthesis approach. In the uh, synthesis approach, uh, as I said, we think of this patch composition to define an image. So we define an image as a cartoon plus weights omega n times, times uh, texture splats or kernels. And we suppose that we have n of them. And this is our image. So these kernels should be something like this. So edge kernels, line kernels, certain texture things. So this is the overall idea, and so on. So we think of images as being locally rotation invariant. So it would be nice to have these kernels also rotationally invariant. So we think that there are not the rotated versions stored in the, text, in the kernel storage as well, but we generate them via rotations. If we know the, the kernel orientation which we'd like to have, then we have to invert, to in, to invert this matrix here uh, to do it right. And uh, so the alpha is now a rotation by uh, uh, the Q minus alpha is a rotation in SO2. So D is now 2. And um, so these are fixed kernels. This is a weight with which we weight the kernel, and we suppose it's uh, a positive uh, Radon measure. I think that's the natural setup for this. And uh, with this is uh, the cartoon. And we suppose this to be uh, a function in BV. But now, We have time-dependent families, so we add time. So this will depend on time. The kernels are fixed, so this will depend on time. And the alpha has, uh, is for sure, spatially varying. So this is an alpha n. Sorry. It's spatially varying. All these functions are naturally also uh, space varying. Yeah? Uh, it's time varying, but in addition, everything is space varying. And uh, so the question is how to estimate this in a correct way. If we have this evolution of the images generated in this, in this uh, uh, remaining approach. So behind there is the flow of diffeomorphism, which tells us that we generate a family of diffeomorphisms, phi, solving this equation of the flow of underlying diffeomorphisms. But then we know, once we have the starting angle, how along this transport path the, uh, um, the angle will change, which allows the right placement of the kernels. And uh, that means the alpha t is an alpha 0. And uh, uh, then we add, uh, uh, so maybe I write it as such. This is an alpha of uh, alpha 0 and uh, the Jacobian of the uh, uh, deformation, the diffeomorphism at time t. And how to do this? So it's just bipolar decomposition. So in 2D, it's very easy. 
so this is uh, the polar decomposition formula. If, we, if you compute the off-diagonal entry, then this tells us about the arc sign of this rotation angle, and you can even stabilize this uh, um, to get rid of the singularities built in there, but I'm not going to tell you about this. So that means this is uh, uh, the overall idea, and uh, then uh, we have to solve the following problem. So we minimize the path energy, which now lives in a space of use generated in this fashion. So these U's depend on the degrees of freedom, cartoon, and uh, vector of weights. And uh, vector of uh, angles. And uh, surely we have to take consistent boundary conditions. So we start here with uh, u0 being, um, oh, maybe I write it, how to write it? Maybe I write it as such. u0 being uh, the u. Um, um, UCA, omega A, alpha A, and the same with B. I will tell you about this, uh, how to find those in a minute. So basically, we pre process the uh, boundary images. U A and U B do their decomposition and then take this as the uh, initial data. And this is the problem uh, which we have to solve. And uh, so the question is how to discretize this. Let me see, this is tableau one. Okay, so the question is uh, <coughs> how to time discretize this. And uh, <coughs> given the recipes we have so far, that is uh, quite easy. <coughs> so we approximate uh, our path energy, again, by discrete path energy, which we define in the analogous way. And then here is a W, which now depends on deformations and on alphas, in addition to mark this uh, really explicitly. And uh, the only thing which is fixed is the set of kernels, which we later have to optimize. And uh, so this depends here now on uh, the, uh, on the cartoons. K, K minus 1, the set of uh, weights, K minus 1, the uh, angles which we already have identified, K minus 1, the cartoons at the K position, the weights at the K position, and the phi at the, uh, uh, which does the mapping from K minus 1 to K. And given this uh, formula up there, we can use these two here to derive the new alpha k and thereby make this patch decomposition applicable. And uh, that's all we have to do. The only thing which we now have to care about is uh, how to find uh, uh, the right kernels. That can be done explicitly or we can do, do it tailored to the two input images, UA and UB. If we do it tailored to the input images, then uh, this can be cast as a variation problem. So now, basically, we have um, UCBs, omega Bs, we have um, alpha, Bs, 
and the same for A. And we have one set of kernels, kappa 1 to kappa n. And the, the, the problem we solve is the following. So first, we ensure that uh, uh, we have a good uh, approximation of the initial images via these U maps there. So that means uh, we take in L2 the composition of cartoon with weights B and the current kernels. So I don't, uh, maybe I add this now and the L the alpha b here and the kernel set 1 to k, 1 to n, uh, minus the ub. And then the same term for a. Maybe I'm allowed to do this in this way here. And we do this in L2 squared. Then we would like to have a decomposition with sparse weight vector. And sparsity is as usual then here uh, if we take it discrete later, yeah. So after a discussion, otherwise we have to talk about sparsity of these, uh, these uh, continuous measures up there. We now think of them as being L1 densities uh, and then we take the L1 of the A and uh, with some mu up front and the, uh, uh, the, the L1 of this would be. So discrete means L1 densities. So for those we can do it, but for those we don't have the, um, uh, the convergence under control. And, um, and now finally uh, there is uh, a factor which cares about the cartoon, and this is just the BV norm of both cartoons. And now we minimize this, and this gives us, in particular, the kernels, and gives us the boundary data of, um, of this problem. And um, I like the concept of this, uh, this uh, Synthesis approach more, but numerically with this we face uh, uh, the following problem. It's not really so. Maybe I show you results. So here you see uh, what we are able to do. First of all, so our kernels are 11 times 11 pixels, and uh, then there are no discrete, there are no continuous angles. So we have a um, also, the uh, discrete uh, rotational group, which generates uh, uh, six, 16 rotations, which we take into account uh, for the rotating here of, uh, of uh, the kernels. And actually, so far, we are not able to compute many kernels in these images. Just two kernels already are sufficient to generate uh, quite nice results. <laughs> And the two kernels found in this case are the following you see over there. And uh, for the, uh, uh, for the um, two uh, portraits of Van Gogh, uh, so these are the two kernels which we are able to identify. And then there is uh, the whole group, discrete rotational group generated by this. And this is fed into the, uh, uh, the code to do the, uh, uh, the patch-based patch synthesis algorithm. And uh, let me now try to, to descend this here. No. Something is descending, but not what I. So um, here you see results for these two boundary images, UA and UB. So here you see the cartoon decomposition evolving. And uh, here you see the weighted kernel components 
uh, based on the two kernels I've shown you in advance, you see they are quite, at least in particular this one is quite sparse. So here you see the rotation of the kernels in a color-coded fashion. Uh, so uh, there's some ongoing rotation. And here you see the flow velocity, which uh, as you see, so the scaling is, uh, is very small because there is not that much happening, but you see uh, basically a, a time-dependent uh, velocity field. You see the same now for the Van Gogh result. And you see that also this behaves better here with the ear. There's a little bit of blending, but in particular the hair and the ear are kept much better in, than the original uh, uh, model. Uh, with the RGB model, here you see the kernel weights. So you see the second one is very sparse. Uh, the first one is uh, also quite sparse. Uh, and uh, so, uh, the rotation is now grayscale. There is some rotation in this uh, texture-dominated uh, frame. And here is uh, the evolution of the uh, velocities. Okay, so given quality, the feature approach, the analysis approach gives even better results. Conceptually, in between, it's not clear what we really plan there. In the analysis approach, the big problem is the step from the continuous idea to the discretization in particular because uh, uh, there are just discrete rotational groups and all these, uh, uh, these problems. And at the end, I would like to entertain you a little bit uh, with the animation uh, generated by the feature. Oh no, this is, no, this is RGB space. Here you see the failure. And also there, so what I actually show you, therefore, it's, uh, it's, it's really the discrete sequence of the 16 computed uh, and the 17 computed shapes, yeah? Uh, images, and uh, here's the other blending, and maybe we stay with the perfect results. So look at the teeth and look at uh, the height on top of the, uh, uh, the small and the, the large cat. And the, there is only a one, two artifacts visible. Here, the blending of the glow, and here, the blending. There is still a bit of blending. The rest is, uh, we do not see any artifact. Please point me to some, some artifact you detected. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you. Um, you. You speak about the blending, and you see this as an artifact. But in fact, it's in the in your model. It's in the metamorphosis model. The Z component is just blending. So, depending uh, on the flow field. So yes. if you have the wrong flow, you have to do really pointwise blending. If there is the perfect flow, uh, you do not have to really do this strong pointwise blending. Basically, the arrangement of the ear, let's take this example, is mainly done by the viscous deformation and less done by really the, the, the blending component, with, which is the material derivative. And basically, it's the goal if objects show, uh, objects should be similar, then there should be. Uh, only a very small blending component necessary to do a good uh, morphing. Okay, but, and then how do, how do you explain that uh, there is less blending with the feature uh, approach, for example? That's, yeah. uh, that's because uh, uh, at the ear, it's very hard to look at these features. Therefore, I show no images of feature components. But uh, really, the ear structure is detected as a feature and it has a certain profile in this 64-dimensional space. And you see this at a different position, you see the same profile. And then there is a strong trend to really match this profile via morphing to this profile. And in the RGB space, in this uh, thing, th there is just texture. There is everything which is, it's not clear what you really blend with what. So therefore, the feature approach is, mu is that much stronger. I should have Any, explained yeah, it better. Gabby. <laughs> yes. Yes. 
No, that is, yeah, you're completely right. This is what I describe as the, would describe as the drawback of the feature approach. Because we do a planning of features, it's completely unclear what in between really the current feature vector is. What we then in addition do, because uh, if we have the deformation field, if we have the flow field, we can do long flow lines. What actually what metamorphosis is doing is doing a long flow lines uh, weighted by compression and extension. Uh, basically, if there is incompressible flow, it's just a linear plant. And this is what we compute, and this is what we live with. Uh, no, we so we interpolate. We interpolate along flow lines the RGB images. If the flow is incompressible, it's just linear interpolation along the flow line in arc length. And if uh, if it's not incompressible, then there is compression and extension, which you have to take into account as as usual. Now this is what happens along the flow line. Along the flow line, the intensity is allowed to change. You pay for this with a Z, as I explained before. And at the end, you can show uh, that, uh, that basically there is a flow path. And in a certain compression, extension, weighted fashion, you add the average between UA and UB at the starting and the end position. That's, that's it what happens. Okay, let's thank Martin again.